My name is Ken Bourne, I'm the Corporate Sales Manager with Leia Healthcare. You'd never guess I was with uh, Leia Healthcare by looking at the slide uh, behind me. Um, I'm following on really from our Deputy MD, Dio O'Connor, a little bit earlier on, talking about the data and in particular uh, Connected Health. Um, I'm the, as I said, I'm the Corporate Sales Manager with Leia Healthcare. Um, my role is to work with organisations to support them and empowering their people to be at their best always. So that's the objective, I suppose, in terms of why we connect data and how we bring it all together for the purposes of building well-being programs that are results-driven and results-focused. So I'm going to introduce you in a second to, to my uh, two guests. Um, so I'm going to ask maybe, Sarah, if you want to, uh, my two esteemed colleagues, let's just say, if you want to uh, introduce yourselves. So hello everyone, um, my name is Sarah O'Neill, I'm a chartered psychologist in terms of my professional identity, um, worked in both the public and private sector, worked in community settings, hospital based settings and psychiatric settings. My current role is working in the private sector delivering mental health care um, and I suppose I'm speaking today as someone who oversees a lot of the programs that Leia deliver to health and wellbeing interventions in the workplace, both in terms of mental health but also in terms of physical and societal health as well. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Clara? Hi, um, my name is Clara O'Gorman. I'm, I'm the employee benefits manager for GSK, a pharmaceutical company. Um, I'm responsible for the design and delivery of our health and wellbeing strategy across Ireland. So we have 1,600 employees um, across five businesses in four different locations. So that brings with it a few of its own challenges. So Clara has her hands full, as you can tell. Um, I suppose Clara is part and parcel of an organisation that we've worked with which, with, which have implemented a health and wellbeing strategy in particular, and we're going to use that as the case study a little bit later in the presentation for the purpose of sharing that information with you um, and how, what the success of that looks like. I suppose what I'm going to do initially is just to ask a question of the two guys and Sarah first in relation to the key trends that you're seeing in the well-being space in the workplace at the moment, what are they at the moment? Absolutely, I mean there's increased attention um, and prioritisation of health and well-being of employees and I suppose there's a couple of major trends in that. We're now in a situation where we have almost full employment and it's difficult to attract individual employees that are really fitting the needs of our organisation so it can be part of the attraction and the retention of employees. But also when we look at the other side of that, like the impact of an employee who's going through a difficult time that they can have on themselves, but also their colleagues and teams. So how we support people to give the best of themselves in work, but recognizing that life strikes, I suppose, situations come up that will be difficult for all of us. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Or should I use a mic? Hello? Oh. Thank you. Hello, is that better? Yes. <laughs> so as I was saying, you know, there's an increasing, I suppose, prioritization of health and well-being and looking at the needs of individual employees, but also the organizational needs that kind of fit around that. And so we heard earlier a little bit around some of the interventions workplaces are bringing in to be able to support their teams. Things like flexible working conditions, people taking time out to work from home, organizations actually asking of employees how they're doing and what they need in their jobs or be in a position in their jobs where they can bring the best of themselves to work. So there's that real shift. But I suppose, as I said, I'm a mental health professional. And one of the things we see in Irish society at the moment is, sorry, is that? is the epidemic of mental health difficulties that are affecting us all. When we look at Irish society, WHO last year recognised in Ireland that we are now in the top 10 countries worldwide of the numbers of our population affected by anxiety disorders. We've known for a long time in developed societies depression is going to be the leading global burden of disease by 2030. So mental health and mental health distress is one of the societal, most significant societal challenges we're all dealing with. And I suppose it's about recognising that mental health and health and well-being, well-being cannot be um, taken apart. 
You know, if, if part of our looking after ourselves, our self-care, is looking after diet, nutrition, sleep, exercise, if something happens that means one of those things get taken away from us, that can suddenly affect our overall emotional well-being, how we're doing with it ourselves. So it's that recognition of health and mental health being two sides of the same coin, an increased prioritisation in terms of health and well-being of employees, an increased recognition of employers that they need to prioritise this, both in terms of meeting the business goals, but also to be able to attract and retain the employees that they want working for them in the first place. So I'd say it's kind of a mix of all of those things. It's never a clear or easy answer, sure. okay. but that would be my take. Clara. Clara, from a GSK perspective, how, what are the key trends at the moment in the health and wellbeing space from, from GSK's perspective? So um, we look at our data every year, so we look at our historic data, um, it might be surveys, health screenings, employee feedback for events, and we decide what our plan is for the, for the following year. And um, what we've found um, over the last um, two to three years um, there's more and more focus on, on a couple of areas, in particular um, physical health and physical well-being. And it's more about, um, it's more than just encouraging our employees to be physically healthy, it's about allowing them the opportunity to be physically active at work or through work. So different programs that encourage that. Um, we're also seeing um, a huge change around um, education around um, health and well-being. So um, linking things to World Health Days or linking things to national events that are going on. Um, things like, um, if it's nutrition, teaching people how to understand and read food labels. So the education around health and well-being is very important. Um, and the, the third big area that we found um, was, was definitely a gap and a focus area for us has been around mental health. Um, so one of the things that we, we never realised it because we hadn't asked, um, but we found um, back in around 2016 that when we did ask the question, that over 60% of our employees felt there was still a stigma around mental health, um, particularly in the workplace. It's one place that people are less confident to share um, mental health struggles. Um, and that only four in ten of our employees actually knew or had the skills, knew what to do or what to say to somebody who was um, struggling with mental health. And so we knew that that was uh, an area that we needed to focus more on. Sure, great. Thanks for that. I suppose it's a nice segue into the um, into Leia Healthcare and the unique. Um, position that we see ourselves uh, in, in being able to support organisations like GSK with the data to inform and educate for the purposes, as I said earlier, of them building that wellbeing strategy. Um, for those of you who were there earlier um, when, when Dio presented to you, there is a big focus on, on the data and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, anybody you listened to earlier, I suppose, from Joe to, to Dio and the rest of the guys, um, there's a big aspect around the personalisation and the you and we're going to show you how some of the data applies in that particular regard for an individual and their own well-being. And then I think the other big aspect for us and, and the other area that we focus on is the evolving element of well-being. So whether that's digital, I suppose, the, the format in which we consume um, well-being and consume information regarding well-being, more importantly, is through various different channels. Um, so there's not really a one-size-fits-all. And I suppose that's the beauty of what we do in Leia Healthcare and that we have access to data beyond the standard data that you can gather from surveys, etc., etc. And we're going to evidence some of that and share some of that with you. Um, we, we operate under a three-pillar model, so Tribe and Body, Tribe and Mind, Tribe and Life. Uh, pretty much self-explanatory and we're going to give you a sense of what they actually look like as we pull the data together. So. Focusing on, uh, on the data itself, um, really this gives you an, uh, the size and the extent of, of the uh, level of and information that we actually have available to us as, as an insurer. So from a claims perspective, and I'm going to show you some um, information regarding claims from a particular organisation, um, obviously aggregated and anonymised claims data, and it'll just give you a sense that when we when we collate all of it together, it's the correlation that you'll see between trends in different areas and how that all comes together. Um, employee assistance programmes, um, assuming most organisations uh, in the room or the organisations that you represent have employee assistance programmes, 
we get very valuable data from that as well. I'm going to go into some of that data in a minute or two and give you a sense of, again, how that correlates and connects with all of the other information that we have available to us. Um, for those of you fortunate enough to have occupational health on site, um, there are key trends and key information in that data as to why people are presenting, how frequently they're presenting, what particular departments they're presenting from, who's taking the ownership of that referral in the first instance, and um, when somebody does um, <coughs> go out on, on sick leave, how that process is managed, etc., etc. And as I said, what were the primary presenting issues? And ultimately then, for the well-being of that individual, how do we get them back um, fit and well and healthy to be back in the role sooner than, than um, you, you would expect. The, the other piece, I suppose, and, and Joe certainly mentioned it earlier on, and I know we have, there are different online programs. I did say people um, interact uh, and consume information on different levels. Um, the, the online program and access to that is, is for that digital savvy uh, individual who wants to share a certain level of information. Some of it is their own perception around how they are at that particular juncture, but it is very informative in terms of their level of engagement, their level of um, interaction, maybe their physical well-being or their perception of their physical and mental well-being. So lots of information available through the uh, online programs. Um, the other side, I suppose, of being the health insurer is that we can link the benefit in a fit-for-purpose sense, which means that the benefit and the utilisation that individual employees are using on an ongoing basis, that we can take that information and we can correlate it back with what we're seeing um, across the other areas to help us develop that, that, that program and to deliver it. So the benefit or some of the benefits that are included as part of what, what would lay offer is certainly health coach. So that's the physical, primarily the physical well-being of an individual. Um, it's a number of um, non-diagnostic tests that an individual does. It's over an eight-week period and they have a face-to-face -face consultation with a uh, health coach. Um, and we bring that on site in, in, in organisations and I'll show you again where and how we get that information and then what we do with that data when we have it available to us. Sorry, is that when you're saying the, the health coach, is that yeah. just, um, uh, say, a finger prick? So that is... No. The, no, no I, I, I'll, give you some the, and all that. I'll give you some of the stats on it in a second, yes. So there's a particular slide that I'll go into more detail in terms of the health coach piece as well. And not dissimilar, I suppose, in terms of the, the heartbeat screening. So the heartbeat screening is available to all the lay healthcare members once every two years. It's a 12 lead electrocardiogram. Um, we're getting information from that and data from that as well, which helps the individual um, in, in that they're more informed in relation to their own health status and indeed helps, helps us on an aggregated and anonymized data to collate all that information for the purposes of building the program. Um, the other important piece, I suppose, is the review meetings and the workshops. So that is with, whether that's with the occupational health team, whether it's with HR, whether it's with your uh, champions, with HR champions within the business or wellbeing champions within the business. And that is sharing and um, that information across the board whereby you, you have the key stakeholders in an organization. So that might be your gym if you're fortunate enough to have one. That can be catering, so your catering team. That can be your sports and social club. So a combination of all of the key stakeholders within your business all contributing to what we, how we get the data and then what we do with it when we have that data available to us. So just to give you a sense in terms of um, what reports look like because the provision of this data both for the individual and for the organisation is vitally important. So you know what and when you're reading, you know what the scores are actually telling you and you know which indicators are being flagged and, and the objective of that being is that you can then attempt to do something about them. So th this particular one is giving you scores around nutrition, um, musculoskeletal and ergonomics, um, sleep, and there was a lot of talk about sleep uh, a little bit earlier, um, financial wellness obviously which affects your mental well-being, um, relationship with smoking and alcohol, etc. And in effect that gives an overall score for the organisation and an overall score, a score for the individual and then an overall score for the organisation. 
Um, in reality, you would never take all of these particular headings and try and tackle them in the, in the one sitting. You would certainly prioritize the ones that are indicating to be poorer um, in terms of the overall results and then address those on an ongoing basis over a period of time, you, and usually a 24 month period. So this is what Health Coach is, uh, is really looking at. It's looking at, it's, as I said, it's a personalized interaction with, with a health coach. There are five non-diagnostic tests, so they're non-diagnostic tests. Um, we're measuring BMI, we're looking at um, the, the waist circumference, we're looking at and comparing those with national weight averages as well. So we really are comparing stats and data comparatively against what the standard norm might be. All of this information also allows us to do it across industries, so we're able to compare different industries, so whether it's pharma, uh, med tech, tech itself, um, financial services, whatever that might be, we're able to uh, compare averages across those organizations and see what benchmarks might and should look like. So this, I suppose, is, is, is feedback then that when we've correlated it, that we're getting from the employees, it's their contribution to what their perception of how, what their well-being is at that particular juncture. And then it's giving a real indication to the organization of what the employees are, um, are feeling in terms of their overall uh, health and well-being. Similarly, I suppose, and that, that was the health coach that we, we, we had a look at, and I gave you a kind of a whistle-stop tour in terms of what that, that data and that information might look like. And it really is around just evidencing all of the data that, that, that we have available to us. Heartbeat's something similar, I suppose, in terms of the fact that we go inside in organizations, we conduct the 12 lead electrocardiograms, as I said earlier, and we get specific information from all of that data. Um, and the type of data that it's giving us, again, relationship with smoking, um, blood pressure, and you can see how all of this is in, interconnected and correlates towards building the program, program overall. Um, we compare against the um, corporate average, um, and as one of my colleagues would normally say, um, corporate Ireland is not a good benchmark to be measuring uh, your, yourself against because usually it, it's not a great indicator of scores overall, but it just gives a sense, I suppose, in terms of where um, you, you might be at. Um, the, the interesting piece on this one um, in particular is the cardiac follow-up. So you're looking at the dark navy colour is the, the representation for the organisation that we've just measured, and the light blue being the lay of corporate average from all of the corporates that we've uh, conducted heartbeats uh, screening in. So if you look at the cardiac follow-up, this, this is GP-led, um, um, and, and what, happen, what happens is then it goes to a cardiologist afterwards, and the cardiologist is reviewing those results and in this particular instance, what we're saying is that 8.9% of those individuals, those 169 individuals who turned up for, for heartbeat screening were referred on for uh, further needs, for further attention in terms of what, what was evidence from the cardiologist's uh, report. So just, just giving you a sense, I suppose, in terms of the information in relation to that. Um, EAP I mentioned, um, EAP a good, a very good indicator in terms of an employee's uh, mental well-being. Um, this evidences the number of the data we share with organizations relative to their own organization, uh, the number of EAP files, um, so number of cases open, uh, and Sarah might give you some more information on that a little bit later on, um, the numbers that were information calls, we benchmarked that as a utilization then against the total number within the organization. Um, in this particular instance, um, the utilization rate is 4.9%. Um, and I wonder if I ask the question here, of your organizations, does everybody know what their EAP utilization is? No? Okay. So, so, some people do, but, but in the main, there's a lot of people not knowing that information. And I suppose this is the point in relation to the data that it is a, a true indicator in terms of what's happening and what the health of your organization is at any, any given point in time. Um, if you have a look, certainly on the next slide, in relation to, um, sorry, we'll go back there. It, it, it's not showing us what's there now, but Sarah, you might give us an indication. What are the, the top three presenting issues that we might see from an EAP perspective? In terms of mental health? Yes. Yeah. Uh, depression, stress, anxiety. Oh. 
Sorry, did everyone hear that? In terms of mental health, depression, stress, and anxiety, but also we see the utilization of the non-mental health care services. So for example, we know approximately 50% of people in recent research commissioned by Maya and last year were naming financial well-being difficulties that have been causing them worry between three and 12 months. And so if you know what that looks like for somebody, if you're waking up the first thing in the morning is that worry about how you pay the bills, you're going to a checkout and you're not sure whether you're able to afford grocery shopping for the week. Those things are not just isolated. They then start to affect your mental well-being, your quality of sleep, how you're feeling in terms of your emotional vulnerability, and it just becomes a vicious snowball. And so one of the things we look at is not only around the kind of mental health presentations, but also the utilisation rates for the other services, which are all um, areas that we know cause distress for people and can kind of start that vicious cycle. So that's financial well-being, it's legal support services, it can be career guidance, if that's for ourselves or if we have somebody at home, we just know what the next step in life is. It's about supporting individual employees with those stresses and worries that come up for all of us from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. I, I did say earlier, I suppose as an insurer, we have um, claims information. Um, I suppose when you're using all of that information available to you, so what, what claims are actually telling you? So if you look at this particular um, overall claims analysis for an organisation, and we'll have a look at the kind of the, the hospital and the everyday uh, medical expenses and those claims in a second. But if you're looking at, we trend uh, the claims analysis in organisations and we're comparing the claims on a, on a year on year basis in any particular areas because there are indicators in here when we look at the scans, it will be endoscopies and colonoscopies. So if you go back and have a look at the nutrition and some of the results that we were getting out of the health coach analysis, that is saying clearly in that particular area that nutrition, fitness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when we pull it all together, we'll give you an indication that they're they are concerns. Um, you'll see in the main, obviously, um, we'll have the reasons for inpatient claims. We'll have the day case claims, and it was alluded to earlier, I suppose, in terms of day case that a lot, a lot, a lot of people are spending a lot less time in hospital now due to um, the improvement, I suppose, in, in, in procedures um, and how technology has advanced in that particular regard. Um, if we look at the top procedures in hospitals, so this is other information and data that we pull together also. So if you're looking at um, colonoscopy, I did say to you in terms of the, the scans piece, um, it's giving you a sense in terms of uh, maternity, appendicectomy, etc., etc. So we have all of that information that we're pulling together. And you'll see when, when, we, when we come to the kind of final slides how the information is correlating across the, the, the different pillars. Um, the other one on the right-hand side is literally only giving you some numbers in terms of the actual hospitals that they're going to. But that is important because we did say about empowering individuals to ensure that they're at their best always. Um, particular hospitals have specialisms in particular areas, so it is about knowing where people are going for particular procedures that we can give them advice, education and guidance in terms of where they should have particular procedures. I suppose the interesting piece on the outpatients, these are your everyday medical uh, receipts, so over half of them will usually be your GP receipts. Um, your routine dental, as you see, your alternative therapies in your, um, in your top five, um, and your physical therapy in, in those ones as well. I suppose overall what it's, what it's giving us is an indication of why people are going and attending um, the GP, what the requirement was, what the medical need was, and then how we address that as part of a wellbeing program or a wellbeing strategy. Cl Clara referenced what a program overview might look like. Um, this was a particular organization which had slightly different pillars in that they were operating on the basis of four pillars, slightly different to what we had, but how were we able to collaborate with them for the purposes of building their wellbeing program? Well, their focus was nutrition, and if you think back to the health coach and some of the information that we got out of that, there was a particular uh, score within there, and we'll show it to you in a second, um, in terms of what that looked like. The physical piece, and Clara mentioned a, a big aspect on, on that as well. We mentioned earlier about um, sedentary lifestyles um, and the fact that we're getting less and, and less exercise. We have some stats in relation to that one as well. Um, the mental well-being, 
We spoke a little bit about, and certainly Sarah spoke a little bit about the EAP. Some of that is also com also comes out as part of the, the health coach and that interaction with the health coach, your mental well-being, and then your lifestyle in general. So if we looked back earlier on to the online programs and getting a sense of people's lifestyles, their sleep patterns, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what was that telling us for the purposes of developing a program for them? What Clara also mentioned was that's got to work in conjunction with event-specific programs. So if you are building something, um, a program, a wellbeing program, you certainly get more bang for your book whereby there is a National Wellbeing Day, there is, you're talking November, whatever it might be. It is connecting those in with your wellbeing for the purposes of it being out there in the media and more employees being exposed to that. And we can definitely support in relation to that. And then I suppose um, employee specific journeys are important. We talked about the health coach. Um, in this regard, it might be employees meeting with a dietitian. So uh, correlating back to your nutrition again. Um, mental health workshops. So educating people in terms of mental well-being, looking at um, mental health uh, first, aid, first aiders. I think Clara's gonna give us a little insight into that in a second. Um, certainly financial well-being, as we said, and, and Sarah said, is a, is a huge impact on uh, people's mental well-being. Um, and then sleep. Um, I think everybody's referenced sleep today in relation to the, the lack of, I suppose, in the main. <coughs> this is really where all of the data comes together and really is the evidence for the purpose of us building the overall program for an organization. What I would say to you is that each one of these programs are available on a standalone basis, but where the magic really works is that where you're able to correlate um, all of the data, put it all together, workshop it, um, with the aid of the key stakeholders, um, gather that information, and then decide then how, how much you're going to try and address in a certain period of time, or what the objectives might be and what the, the in, real indicators are. So if you just look at the nutrition one, so this particular organization, the primary focuses were in these areas. And why were, in the, why were they in these areas? Because all of the indicators from the data that we had gathered were, were telling us that these were the specific areas that we needed to focus on. So if you're looking at the health score result overall under nutrition, 57 out of 100, so it scored pretty poorly. Um, so why was that? So 26% of, of those people who surveyed don't plan their meals, for example. And 32%, and Clara referenced it earlier, don't, can't read uh, food labels. So they haven't been informed and educated. So in Clara's um, example, that was an area that they were going to focus on particularly. You've got your, your, your health coach again is giving you information in relation to your BMI under nutrition. You've got your heartbeat screening, which is telling you um, particular aspects around, um, if you're looking at 23.7% uh, of males were <laughs> obese in this particular organization. So the stats is giving you information that the, as a heading and as a pillar, nutrition is a key aspect to be focused on. Um, not going to go through all of the information on this, but if I just finish the nutrition one, again, from a claims perspective, the data is telling us that endoscopies and colonoscopies are amongst the highest so there is a direct correlation um, in terms of that information. Uh, and you can see the, the other ones for yourself um, across the other three pillars. So fitness, mental health, and lifestyle. So of all of the information that we had gathered from particular this particular organization, we were in a position then to deliver programs. Um, and Clara's going to give an example, I suppose, um, in a second in terms of a program that we would have delivered in conjunction with GSK. And some of that data and the information was derived from the information that I'm sharing with you here today. So this is not GSK's data, but similar, similar data. Um, certainly, Health Score is giving us more information in terms of lifestyle. Sleep is coming up again. Um, musculoskeletal. Um, and ergonomics, so whether you have access to the um, uh, occupational health on site, we're, we're in organisations doing ergonomic assessments, we, have, we see from, from claims data that more claims are coming through for musculoskeletal, um, so you're seeing knees, hips, joints, so more people are out, out there 
um, running, um, and Clara can attest to that yesterday, uh, finishing her, her 10 mile down in Dungarvan. Um, but more and more people are exposed to that, so it is having an impact, and I suppose it is getting and putting the focus in the right areas. Um, financial again comes up, and then under your lifestyle then you have maternity, as we saw earlier from a claims perspective, being under the um, one of the highest claims, so it's, it, it would be a lifestyle claim there. Um, really, I suppose, I, I kind of give me a whistle stop tour in terms of how we gather the data, where we gather it from, what we do with that data, um, how it correlates across all of the different touch points for the purposes of giving us the indicators to allow us to build that well-being program to have a real impact on an organisation. So, Clara, I would ask you, um, we, we kind of had a look at the trends and, and you gave us some examples um, in terms of, of GSK. In a not dissimilar uh, data set, um, what did you take from that and then how did you, I suppose, build your overall wellbeing programme based on the information that we shared with you? Um, so, as you said, we use various different um, data sources. Um, um, we use various different data sources to, to make our decisions. Um, so we um, use a lot of the health screening programs, so either internal health screening programs, be it what our occupational health nurses do, or something like the heartbeat screening, um, which, which Ken has gone through. Um, we also um, would use information like our employee assistance program statistics, so what are our key trends from there, what are our utilisation figures like, are there particular areas that we need to focus on. Um, but one that um, I suppose gave us a bit of a, a shock was the, the MIND score report. Um, we, we did that um, about two years ago, um, and it certainly gave us data that we had never asked for or expected before. Um, and what that gave us was very concrete information about what our employees felt. So the MIND score, as, as, as you've heard today, is an individual report where people go in and they get their own report, but we get an overall company report. Um, and it was the information that we got from that was extremely powerful. Um, it was about our own employees, it wasn't just industry data, it wasn't just the general what's going on in Ireland or across the world. It was very specific to what, to what our employees were feeling about at the time. Um, and we used that then to design our, um, our annual calendar of health and well-being events. And we also used it to get sponsorship from our leadership teams for new programmes. So for example, the Mind Score was one that we very definitely felt we needed to do something different around mental health. Um, and we were able to use the data from the Mind Score report to go to our leadership teams and say, this is what our employees are telling us. It was very specific. We heard some of the stats this morning, particularly around um, thoughts about suicide. Um, and we used that to get the sponsorship we needed for, for future programmes. Sure. And Sarah, you're, you're a huge advocate, obviously, of uh, MindScore. So, in terms of developing MindScore, what was the purpose initially, and what, like the advantages that Clara got from it? Can you share that with the with, with the audience here, just in terms of MindScore and, and some detail in, in, that, in that? So, MindScore is an e-screening assessment tool. So, individuals get a link, and you can openly and honestly engage with MindScore. You don't even need to put in your email address. Every individual user, and some of you will have tried this, you get your report at the end, which is, I suppose, a signposting guide. But then the organisation also gets back the aggregated data. So as Clara and Ken have mentioned, it helps an organisation prioritise, you know, what are the things that we should be addressing in on-site seminars, in workshops? Is there something we should be doing around mental health and wellbeing? But the important thing about MindScore is it allows them to be a benchmark for future. So, for example, GSK would have redone MindScore, and you're able to look at that kind of ROI piece, or you know that what changes have what we have done over the last year, two years, brought about in terms of our general MindScore data, and that can be really important as well because it's one thing to be identifying the challenges that are ongoing. It's another thing to be able to actually look at the efficiencies of what we're delivering on site. And that's, I think, another side of the data. You know, data can be really useful on an organisational basis, on a prevalency kind of um, national basis to figure out what the priorities need to be. But also, what are we putting in place in the, work, in the workplace? Are these evidence-based interventions? Because evidence-based interventions gives the best chance of an individual making positive changes in terms of their 
overall health and well-being, and from an organisational perspective as well. You know, you want this to be evidence-based, engaging, and addressing some of the challenges that are there for individual employees. And that can be everything from stigma, concerns about what people are going to think of me if they know I'm engaging with the EAP programme and work. But it can also be the real life challenges. You know, you have to be home to pick up the kids at a certain time and you just don't actually physically have the time in the day. And that's where digital engagement can be really useful because it means that in your half an hour in the evening you can actually maybe engage with some sort of content which is going to be meaningful for you. And it's everything. It's talking about empowering individuals to make those changes themselves to be able to inform that preventative piece. And there's a real change in discourse over recent years around that but also to make sure there's reactive care so that when those moments happen, that you have in place on-site supports for those employees who are going through that tough time from anything from mental health to their general health and well-being. Great, yeah. perfect. Clara, can I ask in terms of the success of, based on the results, what have you seen in terms of the success of, of what you've rolled out within GSK? Okay. Um, so, in particular, it's nice to be able to measure things. Um, so, um, one of the programs that we implemented was mental health first responders, and we trained 45 of our employees um, across our businesses in Ireland to become mental health first responders, where they learned the, the basic skills about how to help a colleague. So, we were effectively setting up a peer support network. They weren't managers, they were colleagues in the workplace. Um, we started that um, a, 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 early two years ago. Um, and I suppose now we're beginning to be able to measure the impact of it. Um, so for example, when we started the program, our EAP utilisation was quite low. Um, it was lower than I'd ever seen it before. Um, it's normally about 2 to 3%, and for us, it had gone under 1%. Um, and after two years of where the mental health first responders have been working in their own sites, they've been putting in place initiatives for their workplace, um, we have now seen our EAP utilisation increase to over 6%. So again, it's a very clear correlation between um, the mental health first responders um, generating more awareness around mental health, letting their colleagues and people know about the services that are available in work. Um, so I our hope is that there's not more people who need AIP, but is that more people are aware of it and remember it when they really need it, or somebody's reminding them, have you contacted EAP? So that's one very clear correlation in terms of, uh, of a metric of the success of the program. And how will you ensure the ongoing success, I suppose? Yeah. Um, so it's very important for us to continue to change. So we do a, re a review um, in October, November of every year for the following year. So we look at, over the last few years, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and we change our program for the following year. So um, sometimes we found that um, we didn't have good attendance when we brought in a guest speaker. Um, so then we tried webinars, we thought maybe webinars, people would be able to do it in their own time um, and we tried that and, and that was successful as well but actually what we're finding uh, now is that people really engage with one-to-one -one appointments so where they can have a one-to-one -one appointment with a health coach or a sleep expert so where it's something that's very specific to somebody's own personal situation that's more successful for us and then in terms of our mental health first responders, we really need to keep their skills current so that they continue to learn, they're, continue, they're able to continue to support their colleagues well. And um, We've implemented mental health first responder refresher training. And also this year we're starting um, facilitated peer um, group sessions with a psychologist again so they can just talk about their experiences. So a couple of different measures just to, to make sure that they all, they all keep going and that they meet the needs of our employees at that time. Thank you.